you have your Bibles, please turn to John 14. We're going to start here this morning. We have quite a number of scripture. This morning is a little bit more of a teaching than sometimes. The title for the message this morning is The Holy Spirit, Our Helper. And if you would kindly, John, roll a little bit of the uh, reverb off of this, please. Starting in verse 15 of John 14, it says, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. He says, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Father, we thank you that you never leave us, that you don't leave us parentless, but that you become our Father. And Lord, you love us. We thank you for your love. And Father, I ask that you would give us ears to hear what you're speaking to us this morning. Lord, the ears of our spirit, the ears of our heart tuned into you. And so Lord, let the seed of your word be placed in our hearts and let our hearts be good soil this morning. The seed of your word would take root in us and grow and become strong in us and accomplish that which you purpose. So change us, Father. Transform us, Lord, from glory to glory to glory that in you, Lord, we would be lifted up, raised up to the fullness that you have for each of us. We give you praise and thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. How many of you know that our love for Jesus is manifested through our actions? That many times we can talk a pretty good talk, but the reality is what we exhibit with our lives says a whole lot more than what we say with our lips. And he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. What commandments are he talking about? That's a fair question. It says in Mark 12, 30 and 31, there's two commandments. Jesus is speaking here. He says, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. He says, Keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Love the Lord your God. Honor his presence. Our focus is turned towards him. The greatest commandment is that we continue to focus on Jesus. That in spite of the situation in which you find yourself, in spite of difficulties, in spite of crisis, in spite of the things that you could focus on instead of your own gain or your own gratification, whatever it is, first commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. How many of you know that our blessing is contained in focus on Him. That we don't focus on the blessing, we focus on Him. The blessing then flows. But He says the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. He says, not only do you focus on loving me, but love others as well. And this is where we love people for who they are and accept them as they are and extend forgiveness no matter what they've done. And you know, that's good to say, but how many of you know it's a lot more hard when you're the one that's been hurt? And yet that's exactly what Jesus said. It's not just simply about giving lip service to something. It's about living it out. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 15, 10 says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So if we keep his commandments, we abide in his love. If we don't keep his commandments, what are we abiding in? He still loves us. But we're not realizing the benefit of that. And Jesus' desire is that we abide in and show forth his love. Now I want you to note something because both of these commandments, both of these commandments are positive. See, I believe that when Jesus says keep his commandments, my mind 
in the past immediately turn to, well, you can't do this and you shouldn't do this and this is off limits and, you know, keep my commandments. And, and, and you think about the terms of the law. I don't believe Jesus meant that. I believe what he was saying here is, keep my commandments. I command you to love one another. I command you to love me. These two commandments, he says, everything is contained within them. Paul said it this way in Romans 13, starting in verse 8. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandment, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not hear false, bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So what Jesus is saying here is keep my commandments. He says love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. How many of you know that Christianity at its core is not about do's and don'ts? In fact, the, the New Testament says everything is permissible. Not everything is beneficial. There's healthy boundaries for us because God knows that if we get into certain things, that it's not going to be good for us. It's not going to be good for our relationships. But he says, go the other way. Instead of figuring out what you shouldn't do, begin to do what I'm commanding you to do. That is, love me, honor me with your, with your, with your praise, with your worship, with your life, and love your neighbor as yourself. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray, and he will give you another helper, the Father, that he may abide with you forever. You see, when you begin to talk about keeping the Lord's commandments, that's not something that comes natural. And the Lord has given us, through the Holy Spirit, a helper to help us to keep his commandments Jesus prayed this. He knew that we would need this. Because how many of you in and of your own strength can accomplish keeping the commandment of God? Even to love one another or to love him perfectly as he would desire. And so he gives us the helper. And he calls the helper here the spirit of truth. How many of you know that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth? He is truth. John 4, 24, Jesus is ministering to a woman, and this woman has had a past. And this woman's past is not necessarily something that she would like broadcast all over everything. And so Jesus begins to minister to her, and she never tells Jesus exactly what has happened, but he prophetically knows. And he says, this is a woman who has had five husbands, and the one that you're with now is not your husband. And did Jesus condemn the woman? No. It wasn't about right and wrong in that situation. It was about life. And he said, those that worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. John 4, 24, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The Holy Spirit, the helper, teaches us how God wants to be worshipped, how God wants to be loved, teaches us how God wants us to minister to our neighbor and love them as ourselves. Golden rule, do unto others as they have done unto you. Are you listening this morning? Do unto others as you would have them do to you. You know, one of the things that I really I appreciate, you know, when I, I, one of the things I've tried to sow in my life and through my life is mercy. Because I know at some point I'm going to need mercy. I've tried to sow generosity because probably at some point I'm going to need some things. I've tried to sow love because, you know, I'm not always the most lovable person around. Because there's a biblical principle that what you sow, you're going to reap. And so why not sow that which you want to come back to you? Does that make sense? And so you have a coworker in your office or in your retail place or wherever you are that just, just really bugs the tar out of you. 
And they do things that you just don't understand how a human being can make that connection. And they, they just irritate you. And the immediate reaction is, you know, I just want to tell them to leave. I just want to tell them how wrong they are and how lazy they are. And I want to tell them that they aren't doing it right and that they need to get with it. And then I, you know, and, and but the question is, Maybe you're that person to them. Because we always see life through our own lens. And maybe if we step back and you say, you know, do unto others as you want them to do to you. And so if you're irritating someone and you don't even realize it, how do you want them to respond to you? And this is what Jesus was talking about. How to honor. How to minister to your neighbor. To love them as yourself. This isn't natural. You need the Holy Spirit as our helper to help you to do this. John 15, 12, and 13 says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. See, the Holy Spirit, our helper, enables us to love people in unlovable situations. How to look beyond ourselves and minister to the needs of others. There's a spiritual principle. It's a paradox. It says you reach out and minister to other people and you begin to meet their needs that God meets your need in the process. You know, someone that needs physical healing, one of the best things you can do to receive your own healing is to pray for someone else to be healed. It's amazing how that works. But how many times are we so focused on us, me, my, what I want, what I need to get out of this, what I shouldn't do, or what, you know, we focus on ourselves and we miss the opportunities that are all around us to minister to the needs of others. See, the world does not understand this, he says, John says there. The world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. They haven't seen the Holy Spirit. They don't know the Holy Spirit. They don't have eyes to see the Holy Spirit. That is a primary difference between you as a believer and those that are not believers is that you have a spiritual insight, spiritual eyes. You have been reborn and the Spirit of God lives within you, communing with your spirit. That's literally what the regeneration of a life means. When you come to Jesus, something is, is clicked. Something turns on in you. And you receive spiritual insight that you were dead to before. And you can't explain that to a believer. That's why an unbeliever can sit in a service like this and not experience much of anything. Because they don't have the spiritual insight or the spiritual antenna, if you will, to receive. And yet when they commit their life to Jesus Christ, they invite him into their life. They say, Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. I want you to be my Lord. And they confess their sin. The Bible says he is faithful and he is just and he forgives your sin. And what that means is that it doesn't matter what you've done. We don't care what you've done in your past unless it affects your future. What we care about is where you're going, not where you've been. And that's what Jesus cares about. He says, I'm going to give you a fresh start, a fresh chance. I'm going to give you a new life. I'm going to give you the spirit of the living God living in you. Because, see, your future is a whole lot more exciting than your past ever has been. But it takes the spirit of God. It takes the spirit of the living God living in you. The world doesn't understand this, but he says, you know the Holy Spirit. He dwells within you. We've talked about this the last couple of weeks, the Holy Spirit in you. He dwells with you and in you. He says in verse 17, he dwells with you. That's the Holy Spirit alongside of you, coming upon you, resting upon you, that aspect of his presence that goes ahead of you, and the Holy Spirit in you, that aspect that comes at that salvation experience when the Spirit of the living God draws you to himself. 
See, the Holy Spirit is our helper, bringing life to those around us. And he says, you're not alone. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will be your father, God says. And I will come to you through the helper, the Holy Spirit. It's God's presence with us to help us to do what he's asking us to do, what he's calling us to do. And this is what Jesus experienced on earth. Jesus needed the Holy Spirit. It's interesting because before Jesus did anything, we see an illustration of this in Luke 3, 22. The Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him, Jesus, and a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, and you I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit rested upon him. If Jesus needed the Holy Spirit resting upon him, how, many, how much more do we need the Holy Spirit resting upon us, going ahead of us? This was at the beginning of his ministry. Jesus hadn't done anything. And yet he needed the Holy Spirit's power. He needed the Holy Spirit's presence. He needed the Holy Spirit's help to accomplish and do what, the, what, what God had assigned for him to do in the next three years. It says that as the Holy Spirit helped him, that Jesus only did what his Father had modeled. It says in John 5, 19, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. You know, it's interesting. Jesus didn't take initiative himself. I want you to think about that. Jesus didn't come to earth. He didn't start his ministry and say, okay, now this is what I want to do. I don't believe Jesus ever said that, at least not concerning anything important. He never said, this is what I want to do, unless he had seen his father do it, unless it was part of the plan. Jesus didn't take initiative in himself. He only did what the father did. He only said what the father said. Nothing less and yet nothing more. And how many of us in this world today have that same kind of restraint? That we will only do what the Holy Spirit is helping us to do, is resting upon us to do. That we'll understand his voice and not move ahead and yet not lag behind. Hello? How many of us are willing and able to have that same restraint, to see what the Father is seeing? So you go into your workplace, and instead of just seeing it through the natural eyes, you begin to see that God has a purpose and a vision for you being in that place. And you begin to see people through a different lens, and you begin to see them differently because now instead of seeing them in the natural the way that they are, you begin to see them through the spirit of what God sees in them. We have to do what the Father is doing. And so God may have you in a certain place or in a family or in a situation or a circumstance where God wants to utilize you to make a difference and you have to begin to see not in the natural, not what is going on, but you step back a half a step. You say, God, what are you doing in this situation? What would you have me to engage in? And you walk in obedience. The Holy Spirit helps you to do that. The Holy Spirit helps us to see these things. You have to say what the Father is saying. God may give you words to speak. How many of you have ever been in a situation that you didn't know what in the heck to say? You know, if you're in that situation, probably don't say anything. Have you ever noticed that you can talk yourself right into a hole if you'll allow yourself to? Don't do that. Just simply say what God gives you to say. And it may not make total sense. It may be stepping out in saying something that, you know, if you say, well, I don't know if this makes sense, but this is what I feel like I need to tell you or say to you. And let me give you another, another, another hint. If God's doing that, if it's something negative, if it's a word of correction, be quiet. God doesn't accuse people. God doesn't accuse other people. Most of the time, if not all the time, I can't speak 100%, but most of the time those words are coming out of your own woundedness. They're not coming from the Spirit of God. God doesn't help us to criticize other people. God doesn't help us to beat other people down. 
God doesn't help us to somehow put that person in their place. What God does is he utilizes us to love and to accept and to forgive, to love our neighbor as ourselves, to, to do to other people the, what we would have them do to us. And if you continue to feel like you have a negative word, take that person in private and submit it to them and, and, and even do so with a witness in there because it's like, you know, you say, look, I'm going to submit this to you and you take it. And if it makes sense to you, lay hold of it. And if not, let it go. But see, the Holy Spirit will utilize what you say if you're saying what the Father is saying. What does the Father see in those situations? Because you see, the, the privilege that we have as believers is that we get to impart the Holy Spirit to those around us. Whether it's through gifting, or whether it's through our speech, or whether it's through our touch, or whether whatever it is, we get to impart the Holy Spirit's presence and power. And the Holy Spirit is helping us to understand what is needed in a specific situation. I mentioned them, but I want to look at this in a little bit of depth. Because practically speaking, how does this happen? When you release the presence of the Holy Spirit, there's three primary ways. One is through your words. Words have the power to, to build up. Words have the power to tear down. But when the Spirit is giving you the words to say, those words will carry life. And so God may give you a prophetic understanding of what needs to happen, and you begin to speak that out. If it's really God, there will be a recipient that needs to hear what you're speaking. God is really speaking. And you know what? If you go to a person and you, you, begin to, you begin to sense this is what the Holy Spirit is saying, and they receive it, great. If they don't, then don't worry about it. Because it's not up to you to bring something to pass. It's simply up, up to you to be the messenger. This is what the Lord seems to be saying. And I've had people that, you know, I've had prophetic words or a word of knowledge that has come, and I've given that word of knowledge to that person or perhaps in a setting like this, and, and, and it seemed like on the outside that nothing was happening. But they've come back later and said, you know, when you said that, it really irritated me or it really made me angry, but I also realized that it was really true. And they'll come back later and thank me. And see, that's the way it works sometimes. When you, but, you know, most of the time when God wants to release a word, it's a word of encouragement. It's a word that says, you know what, you're on the right track. It's a word that says what you are doing, God appreciates. Many times it's as simple as saying, do you realize that God loves you? That God deeply cares about you. Or perhaps you feel like, you know, you, you get a word that says, you know, I just feel like I'm supposed to tell you that, 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 you know, God's mercy is for you. You don't know what's going on in that person. You don't know what they've been through. But you simply share that word with them. And it sticks in their heart because you didn't know this, but the night before they were doing this and involved in this and going this, and they're feeling really guilty about it. And they think God is going to punish them and that he's going to beat them over the head with a two by four if he gets a chance. And so if there's being afraid of God and you give that word that says, you know what? God's mercy is for you. He delights in showing you mercy. A second way is through physical touch. And we're, we understand this, that spiritual things are many times imparted as we lay hands on one another. Now, when I say lay hands, I'm meaning it appropriately. I'm not saying punch them out. I'm not saying do something inappropriate. What I'm saying is you put their hand on your, your hand on their shoulder, and you simply impart the thing that you feel like the Lord wants to impart, whether that's grace or whether that's wisdom or whether that's strength, whatever it may be, whatever the Holy Spirit is helping you to remember at that time. But, you know, sometimes one of the best things to do is simply come up and give a person an, an appropriate hug. Simply affection. An important way of imparting the love of God to another person. To love our neighbor as ourselves. A third way that we release his presence is through prophetic act. And this is a little bit different because sometimes this happens in a service or this can happen in a, in a workplace. And, you know, and you read through the Old Testament, and there was some really odd prophetic acts. 
I mean, there really was. One guy had to lay naked for three years, and, you know, I mean, it was, it's kind of bizarre. I, I, I don't really subscribe to that for our present time. God's never asked me to do that, thank him. But, you know, prophetic act, I mean, I remember one time, this is when we were up on State Route 70, and we were, to, uh, we were, this is before we came together with restoration, we were in church planning, we had, I don't know, 130, 150 people, and, and we were in the building there, uh, the Brethren Church. And the way that the road was, State Route 70 ran east-west, and then there was a road that went south for just a little bit, and then you took a left, and it came back up to 70, and it was sort of like a triangle in there. And I just felt like that God wanted me to claim that for his kingdom. And so I did. I said, Lord, thank you, and I received this, you know, and, 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 and I felt like he wanted me to drive around this kind of little triangle was it, I mean, it was, I don't know, it was probably 100 acres there, maybe, maybe not that much. But anyway, to drive around that seven times. Okay, I guess. So I did. And, you know, you, you feel kind of funny doing something like that, particularly because there's construction workers at one of the corners. And, you know... You go by one time, nobody pays any attention. About time number five, they're saying, wait a minute, didn't I see that guy, you know? Is he coming again? And, uh, but, you know, I drove around that seven times. And you know what was interesting is, you know, we then, I'm thinking, okay, this must be for us. We tried to buy that property. It was actually two properties in there. And so we went and we tried to buy that property. And, you know, and, and it wasn't that we didn't have the money. We had a very good down payment. We could have bought that property. It just never worked out. It never happened. There were things that, you know, and it was frustrating. And so then we, we, we came here. And Brother Gene and I came together and we merged congregations. And I went up there about a year, year and a half later, and they were breaking ground on a church building up there. The very property that I claimed, and it was another congregation that had moved, or was moving from, uh, on, sort of more into Bradenton. They were moving out a little further east, and they were expanding their facilities. And it was the very property that we had tried and tried and tried to buy it and couldn't, and they did. And now there's a church building there. Because you see, sometimes the prophetic act that God puts on your heart isn't for you. Sometimes it's for the kingdom. Looking not only to our needs, but also to the needs of others. Loving our neighbor as ourselves means sometimes we don't understand what God is doing, but he wants us to sow into something that's important to him. This happens personally, too, and, and I've told this story, but I remember this was soon. We, we experienced a really negative situation in our congregation in about 1999. And, you know, we had, Nancy and I had to be strong during that time, which is fine. But how many of you know that there needs to be times when you're weak and when you can receive ministry as well as, as give ministry? And I was up at Christian retreat one time, and I responded to a message and, and, and I don't even remember the message. I don't remember the speaker. But I remember going up, and, and I just be, and, and, and God, I, I'm not a crier, but that night I cried. But there was a, a violinist that came over and just began to play, just play. And I don't know how long she was there, but as she played, I cried more. And as she continued to play, I cried even more. And it was like there was something cleansing was happening because of the prophetic act was releasing through her. And then she moved on to somebody else. But, you know, sometimes you and I are, will be called to do things that don't make sense in the natural, and yet that has, carries a very powerful impact in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps us to recognize when and what those things are and gives us the courage and the confidence to move ahead, even though it might not make sense and even though nobody has seen that before. The Holy Spirit is our helper. We 
our available vessels. And his power and his presence is released through us as we're obedient. If we're not obedient, it's not like you're going to get the power or you're going to necessarily sense this dynamic presence until you get into a position where you need that or where he's released in that. You know, sometimes it would be nice you know, to sort of feel like, okay, God, you know, you've poured in, you poured in, you have this conscious understanding and this conscious feeling of, of okay, you know, God, I'm full of, ever, full of whatever you have for me, so now I'm going to go out. No, usually you don't feel that until you need it. And you don't need it until you put yourself in a situation where it requires your faith to bring it about. This morning, I want to invite us to receive the Holy Spirit as our helper. To rest upon you. You see, when you and I minister, we minister to people. It's people that Jesus cares about. Do you realize that Jesus really, I mean, he cares, but he doesn't care. He cares about, for instance, you know, he cares about whether I have a guitar or don't have a guitar. He cares about whether I have a nice car or, you know, if I want a nice car, whatever. He, he cares about the issues of life. He cares about whether we're getting along as a family and those kinds of things. But you know what he really cares about is not our stuff. He cares about the people that he asks us to minister to. I think God would, and that's ministry. Because as you involve yourself in ministry, it ultimately comes down to other people. And there's no substitute for people. There's no substitute for that. Some people think, well, if I minister, I, I'm going to be up front. I'm going to preach or I'm going to do. No, no, that might happen. That's not where the action is. Action is with other people that you meet, that you interact with, that need in them what you already have. And that's the presence, the power of God resting upon you. This is ministry. And we need the Holy Spirit's help to identify those opportunities and situations and to move into the presence and power that he wants to impart to that person. So this morning, I want to invite the Holy Spirit to rest upon you in power and in love. But you know, John the Baptist said something of Jesus. He said, I baptize you with water. But one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. I also want to invite the Holy Spirit to rest upon you, to baptize you, if you will, with his fire. To burn away anything that does not glorify God in your life. Anything that would separate you or, or put a wedge in between your relationship with God, that thing needs to be burnt away. And you and I can't necessarily, we can to a certain extent, but most of the time, if something is pretty deeply rooted in our lives, it takes more than our natural help. Have you ever tried to change a, a bad habit? Has it worked? I've heard of alcoholics that have been dry for 25 years. And then one day something happens and they go back to it and they're worse off than they were. What's going on there? Well, see, we all have a need and that need is for Jesus. That need is for his power, for his presence. And so things that don't glorify God, things that don't, 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 don't draw us near to him need to go in our lives. And so this morning, I want to invite the Holy Spirit to start a fire in your life. To not only burn away that which is not of God, but to begin to light a fire in your life so that you will bring the light of the life of God's presence to those around you. That you have the confidence and the courage to walk in victory and to walk into all the fullness that God has as you minister to those that God places before you. You see, we desperately need him. If you love me, 
keep my commandments. And I will send the Holy Spirit to help you. Let's stand again. The worship team to come. I want you to bow your heads. If you're willing to receive the Holy Spirit resting upon you, I want you to lift your hands. He is your helper if you will allow him to be so. But understand that as you receive this aspect of the Holy Spirit, that it may lead you into things that you never planned for but that God intends for you to move into. It may take you out of a comfort zone that you've cherished for a long time. He may begin to put his finger on things and say, I want to change this in your life. I'm helping you to do so. The first thing I want us to do is I want us to begin to worship. Let's begin to lift up. Lift up the Lord. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. 